this mur- Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. Lynn? Lynn! Hello? I don't know what they have us out here for anyway. We're supposed to be looking for that little girl who's missing? I know that, you goof. But we're not going to find her in this stinky old forest full of mosquitoes. If you were a kid running away from home, wouldn't you go somewhere more exciting than this? Eh, you do have a point. I used to go all over the place during the summers when I was a kid. One time I even went all the way to Chicago. It was back before my mom had dinner on the table. Boy, those were the days, huh? Spending all summer with nothing to do, no responsibilities, no Air Force Base saying, today you're gonna go into the woods when it's hot as heck and look for... Wait a tick. What's that? What? There's something on the ground there. Something... turquoise. How curious. It's a little pair of shorts. And look, here's a little pair of loafers. And socks. Very neatly folded. What on earth would a little girl be doing in the woods without her clothes? (sighs) Oh god. It's... It's her. This is our first episode on Lynn Harper, a 12-year-old girl whose murder in 1959 forever changed her small town in Ontario, Canada. This week, we'll cover the days leading up to the murder, the discovery of the body, and the devastating trial that followed. Next week, we'll look at what has happened in the years since and what those developments mean for this unsolved case. The year was 1959. Clinton, Ontario, was a sleepy rural town nestled up against a bustling Canadian Air Force base. The base had become particularly valuable during World War II, when the government realized that its topography was extremely similar to another important location overseas. The cliffs of nearby Lake Huron gave off the look and feel of England, where many of its soldiers were being deployed to help defend against Nazi bombings. The similarities made it an ideal place to train Canadian airmen in the use of radar technology, which would be affected by the presence of the cliffs abroad. After the war, the Clinton base remained operational, becoming the largest radar training center in the country. As it grew into a permanent station, accommodations were needed for the wives and families of the men stationed there. So a housing facility was built called the Permanent Married Quarters, Like most things in the military, it was neat and orderly, right on down to its rose bushes. Where you and your family lived in the permanent married quarters was determined by the insignia on your jacket. Sergeants lived with sergeants, and subordinate officers lived with others of their rank. While this hierarchical layout may have seemed a bit clinical to the adults, for the children living in and around the base, it was an absolutely idyllic place to live. In 1959, summer days in Clinton were spent riding bikes up and down the county road, swimming in the local swimming hole, and hitching rides to see the ponies, owned by the town eccentric on Highway 8. No one worried about the safety of their children, and why should they? The craziest thing known to happen around Clinton was farmers losing sight of their calves. This was always a big deal for the kids. Tracking down a calf and bringing it back home to the farm was great fun. Okay, kids, get her in the barn. In you go, girl. Thanks for returning my calf, kiddos. Starting to think you're setting them loose because you like finding them so much. Twelve-year-old Lynn Harper was one of those children. Her father, Leslie Harper, was an officer on the base, and Lynn's family had lived in the permanent married quarters since moving there two years prior, in 1957. Lynn lived with her father, her mother Shirley, and her two siblings, an older brother Barry and a younger brother Jeffrey. Their house on the base was quiet and orderly, so when Lynn craved excitement, she loved going to the nearby homes of friends with bigger, rowdier families. Lynn loved being a part of the action. 
However, Lin was a responsible and well-mannered student, active in Sunday school, Bible class, and Girl Guides, uh, the Canadian equivalent of Girl Scouts. Lynn's teachers always spoke very highly of her. Lynn Harper. Oh, she's one of my favorite students. She always sits in the front of the class, always does her homework, and is very eager to participate. I feel bad, though. I think sometimes the other kids don't find her uh, quite as charming as I do. I think she'll do better as an adult, to be honest. But despite her academic success, Lynn had trouble fitting in. She was often described by fellow classmates as bossy or mouthy. The same skills that made her an assertive and organized leader in Girl Guides didn't necessarily make her a popular figure at school. And for all her boldness, she could also be shy. She had a scar on her lip from childhood that sometimes made her self-conscious, especially when she started to become interested in dating and boys. Because Lynn's school was held on the base, she was part of a split class for both 7th and 8th grade students. This was a practical maneuver dictated by the uneven number of kids in each age group and a desire to keep the school's budget down. But it greatly affected Lynn. At 12, Lynn was on the younger end of a class full of 13 and 14-year-olds. She desperately wanted to be a part of their in-crowd, but she tended to find herself on its outside more often than not. So as you might imagine, Lynn was thrilled when she was invited to a party with the older kids on the night of June 5th, 1959. It was a birthday party for one of Lynn's classmates, a popular girl named Lorraine Wood. Lorraine's parents were a little more liberal than most in the religious, orderly town, so it was a rare opportunity to dance and flirt with cute boys. Okay, kids, we're heading out. There's pop in the fridge. Don't touch my beers. And don't do anything I wouldn't do. (laughs) You're giving them a heck of a lot of leeway, Karen. Lynn was excited to be at the party, and she wanted to dance. There was just one problem. No one was asking her to. Not even George Archibald, the 13-year-old boy from her class with whom she had gone out a few times. George wasn't paying attention to Lynn, so she looked around the room, surveying her options for other dancing partners. Her eyes landed on Stephen Truscott, a handsome, popular, athletic boy from her class at school. At 14 years old and 5 feet 9 inches, he was very popular amongst the girls on the base. And after working up the courage to approach him, Lynn asked him to dance. Ever polite, Stephen accepted, even if dancing with Lynn wasn't something he necessarily wanted to do. But Lynn was oblivious and in heaven as she danced with Stephen. She didn't pick up on his cues at all when he tried to tactfully disentangle himself from her. When Stephen's patience with the situation began to wear thin, he asked the birthday girl Lorraine to step in and ask him to dance. Briefly exhilarated, Lynn returned to her spot on the sidelines and watched Stephen dance with Lorraine. She was smitten and would go out of her way to spend time with Stephen again. A few days later, on the evening of June 9th, the Harper family's day was rounding out to be one like any other. Where is Lynn? Her dinner is going to get cold. She's always a little late when she has a basketball game, remember? Her coach is giving her a ride home afterwards. Oh, who are they playing? Goderich. Oh, she'll be so excited if they win. And they did win. Lynn came home around 5.30 p.m. that evening, happy and flushed, from beating a rival basketball team in the area. Her parents were almost done with their dinner, so they retired to the living room, leaving Lynn with a plate of turkey, gravy, peas, and potatoes, with pineapple upside-down cake for dessert. It was a gorgeous summer night, and Lynn was eager to go back out and play. So she wolfed down her food as quickly as she could. A neighbor was taking Lynn's younger brother to swim that evening, not at the local swimming hole, but at the pool on the base where an adult chaperone was needed to swim. Lynn asked if she could go too, but her parents said no. I can't ask our neighbor to take you too. What, am I going to ask him to come over here and do the dishes next? It's too much. No. It's no use pouting at me. You heard your mother. No means no. Lynn, you're wearing on my last nerve. If you can find a pass to swim at the pool solo, fine. You may go. 
but otherwise, stop whining about it. Lynn raced out to try to procure a pass, but soon returned empty-handed and frustrated. And Lynn had to do the dishes. It wasn't that she minded doing the chore. She just felt extremely frustrated to be stuck at home, missing out on the fun she was sure her classmates were having. And so, after finishing the dishes, Lynn got ready to go back out, putting on a special locket given to her by her aunt a few weeks before. It was 6.15 p.m. on the evening of June 9th when Lynn passed her mom on her way out the door. She didn't say where she was going. And her mother, Shirley, didn't ask. This was normal. In their safe, rural community, Lynn's parents were used to Lynn doing her own thing. Of course. Lynn's mom had no way of knowing it was the last time she'd ever see her daughter alive. Lynn headed toward the schoolyard, a walk that normally took about five minutes. But for some reason, she ventured down a meandering alternate route, which burned about 25 minutes. Along the way, she was seen by several neighbors. It was about 6.35 p.m. on June 9th when Lynn arrived at the schoolyard. Okay, brownies, get ready to do a scavenger hunt. Hey, hey, listen to me. I need you to focus. Heavens, it is tough to organize you girls when there are only two of us and 15 of you. Two of Lynn's girl guide leaders were at the schoolyard, organizing a scavenger hunt for their brownie scouts. Lynn was bored and looking for something to do, so she asked if she could stay and help. The leaders welcomed an extra set of hands, and Lynn set about expertly organizing the Brownie Scouts into groups. Once the children had started the hunt, Lynn stayed and chatted with the Girl Guide leaders for about 20 minutes. She mentioned that her mother was cross with her, referencing their small tiff over swimming. At around 7 p.m., Stephen Truscott, the handsome boy Lynn had danced with the week before, rode into the schoolyard. Lynn felt her heart flutter as she saw him. She quickly found an excuse to leave her girl guide leaders and go over to him. She felt bolder talking to him after they had danced together just a few nights before. So she asked him for a ride on his bike, saying she was looking to go towards the nearby Highway 8. Did she do this because she really wanted to get to Highway 8? Or was she seizing an opportunity to be close to Stephen? Regardless, Stephen agreed to give Lynn a ride saying he was planning on going that direction anyway. He wanted to see if any kids were at the swimming hole. So the two children set off into the slightly setting sun, walking around the school to the county road that would take them to the highway. Two kids, an innocent crush, a bike ride on a hot summer night. It was like a scene in a feel-good movie. But unbeknownst to Stephen and Lynn, the bike ride they were about to take would mark a point from which they could never return. Coming up, a search party from the airbase makes a shocking discovery. And now, back to the story. In the early evening of June 9th, 1959, Lynn Harper's stomach was full of butterflies. She had just asked her crush... Stephen Truscott, to give her a ride to the highway on his bike, and he had agreed. The two preteens lived on the Air Force Base in Clinton, Ontario, where their parents worked. Stephen noted that the time was around 7.20 p.m. as they passed a couple classmates on their way to the county road. When they got there, Lynn hopped on his crossbar and they set off toward the highway. As they gathered speed on the hot June evening, the wind streaming through their hair was a welcome relief from the sweltering day. Lynn happily turned around to talk to Stephen as they rode, telling him about the argument she'd had with her mom earlier over swimming. She also asked if Stephen knew of the little white house on Highway 8, where a kind, eccentric man kept a yard full of Shetland ponies. Lynn and a friend had hitchhiked there in the past and fed the ponies apples. She said she might go there again tonight. The two passed familiar landmarks going past Lawson's Bush, a patch of woods named after a nearby farmer, and crossed the bridge arching over the swimming hole. Then they rode up to the busy Highway 8, 
where cars were zooming back and forth. And here's where the story gets murky. What we do know is that about half an hour later, Stephen returned to the schoolyard around 8 p.m. alone. One boy asked where Lynn was, having seen them ride off together. Did Stephen feed her to the fish? Well, but Stephen told the boy no. He had just dropped her off at the highway like she had asked him to. Stephen then made his way to the basketball courts, where some friends were hanging out, including Lorraine Wood, who'd hosted last week's party, and Stephen's 16-year-old brother, Ken. Ken gleefully reminded Stephen that it was his turn to babysit their younger siblings that night. So Stephen grabbed his bike and began pedaling home. There, he settled in for babysitting. Around 8.45 p.m., Stephen's friend Butch George stopped by his house. The two hung out for a bit while Stephen watched his two younger siblings. Meanwhile, at the Harper residence, June 9th was transforming from a normal day into a stressful evening. This isn't like Lynn. She knows she's supposed to be home by 9. Her bedtime is at 9.30 p.m. She'll come on home now. Don't you worry. Do you think she's upset because we quarreled earlier when she wanted to go swimming and I said that she couldn't? Oh, I'm sure she just lost track of time and is peddling home right now. Yes, you're probably right. It's just... I don't know. I just can't shake this feeling that something isn't right. What if she tried to run away from home because of our fight? I'd feel terrible. I'd never forgive myself. Where would she even go if she did a thing like that? I don't know. Her grandmother's? Well, that's 80 miles away. Lynn will turn up any moment now. Just you wait. But Lynn didn't turn up. Increasingly worried, Shirley asked Lynn's older brother, Barry, to go out and look for his sister. He didn't find any sign of her. At 10.30 p.m., George Archibald, the boy with whom Lynn had gone out a few times, stopped by the Harper residence to see if Lynn was around. He'd heard that Lynn was biking with Stephen and felt a little jealous. George found Barry in the front yard, who told him that Lynn had not come home. By now, Lynn's mother was distraught. I'm telling you, something is not right. This isn't like Lynn. Leslie, call the police! Now what am I going to tell them? That our daughter is skipping out on her curfew? They have more important things to worry about. More important than the safety of our daughter? Leslie, something could have happened to her. We need to do something. I really think that we should call the police. All right, all right. How about I go talk to Frank? Flight Sergeant Frank Johnson was the Harper's next door neighbor and the NCO in charge of the Air Force Police. It was shortly after 11 p.m. when Leslie Harper went to see him on the night of June 9th. Frank, my daughter Lynn is missing. Her curfew is 9 p.m. and she never misses it. Probably just a little girl being naughty. But let's put out an alert so we can bring the little scamp home as soon as possible. I bet she just lost track of time at the custard cup eating ice cream with the older girls. Perhaps. This always happens when they become teenagers. Anywhere else you can think of that she might go? Mm, only place I can think of would be her grandmother's. She did quarrel a bit with Shirley after dinner tonight. She wanted to go to the pool, and we said no. But that's not a reason to run away, is it? I mean, how would she even get there? It's 80 miles from here. Think she'd hitch a ride? Our Lynn? Oh, gosh. I can't imagine that... If you think it's possible she could have gone to her grandma's, we should put in the alert. Police need to know where to look, you know. Lynn Harper, age 12 years, 5 foot 3 inches tall, 100 pounds, white print blouse, blue shorts. Hasn't been home since about 1900 hours on June 9th, 1959. Possible she is hitchhiking to her grandmother's in Port Stanley, Ontario. Thanks, Frank. You're a good man. I'll let you know if anything turns up. She'll be back home soon, don't you worry now. Get some sleep. You'll need it the next few years. Within minutes, all provincial police cars were ordered to be on the lookout for a runaway little girl. The Harper family spent the night with the lights on and the drapes open, like a lighthouse, praying it would guide their little girl home. 
On the morning of June 10th, there was still no sign of Lynn. Leslie Harper began to match his wife's level of worry. Something was off. Lynn was a responsible kid. She'd never stay out all night, would she? Leslie went around the neighborhood asking if anyone had any info on who may have seen his daughter last, hoping for a clue to her whereabouts. He was told about Stephen's bike ride with Lynn and went over to Stephen's house to talk to him. If Lynn's house was neat and orderly, the Trescott house was the opposite. On the far side of the permanent married quarters from Lynn's house, the Trescott residence was covered in bikes, toys, and the mess that comes with having four rowdy children. Yes? Hello? Can I help you? It's quite early in the morning. My little girl, Lynn, never came home last night. She may have run away. I understand that your son Stephen may have seen her before she ran off. Oh, uh, how curious. Stephen has never mentioned to Lynn. Uh, Let me go and get him. What did you say your name was? I'm Leslie. Leslie Harper. Doris Truscott. Pleased to meet you. Stephen? Come on down here. Do you know a girl named Lynn? When Leslie Harper and Doris Truscott found themselves face-to-face on the morning of June 10th, they were strangers to each other. Neither one had any idea that their families would soon be irrevocably intertwined. Leslie Harper asked Stephen if he had seen his daughter, and Stephen said he had, recounting the events of the previous evening. Stephen said that he had seen her in the schoolyard and that she had asked him for a ride to Highway 8. He had given her a ride on his crossbar, passing Lawson's Bush, over the bridge, and on to the highway. He said that when he got to the highway, he dropped Lynn off. She didn't say where she was going, and he pedaled back toward the swimming hole. But, he said, something made him stop and look back. And there... He saw Lynn standing near the highway as a car pulled off the road and over to her, reversing slightly to get closer. Stephen was interested in cars, so he had a good idea as to the make and model of this particular car. It had large wings on the back, as was fashionable at the time. He thought it was a late model Chevy with a large amount of chrome. He also noted that there was something yellow Maybe a license plate or possibly a bumper sticker. Oh, God. So you're saying that the last time you saw Lynn, she was getting into a stranger's chromed-out 59 Chevy? I'm sure she's okay, Mr. Harper. Kids hitchhike. They do it all the time. Do they? Oh, goodness. I hope she comes home soon. On Thursday, June 11, 1959, there was still no sign of Lynn. Two days had now passed since she had failed to come home. The airbase organized a search party of 250 men to go out and look for her. The men were split into groups to tackle different areas of the base. George Edens was in the group that searched Lawson's Bush, the patch of woods off the county road named after a nearby farmer. Since Lynn was still being treated as a runaway, the men weren't expecting to find anything there. But while searching, George came across a set of little girls' clothes. They were neatly stacked amongst the trees. A pair of turquoise shorts, two neatly rolled socks, and a pair of small brown loafers. George was wondering what on earth a little girl might be up to in the woods without her clothes when something made him stop short. There, barely concealed beneath some branches ripped from nearby trees, was the body of 12-year-old Lynn. She was nude from the chest down. Around her neck, her blouse had been tied and knotted below her chin. The only clue to the culprit behind this atrocious act was one very vague imprint in the dirt. It was difficult to say for sure, but the imprint looked like it could have been left by a shoe. Within hours, the Clinton Air Force Base was reeling, Who would do such a horrific thing to a little girl? The answer, for some, would be nearly as horrifying as the crime. The last person to have seen Lynn alive was 14-year-old Stephen Truscott. 
who claimed that he saw her getting into a late model Chevy as he pedaled away from her on the fateful evening of June 9, 1959. On June 12, the day after Lynn's body was found, the police made an arrest. And so in this equation, we're solving for X. What is X? Anybody? Sir, I'm sorry to interrupt your class. Uh, well, what is it, officer? I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask one of your students to um, come with me. Son, get your things. Let's go. The boy was Stephen Truscott. Police removed him from his class and took him to the guardhouse on the base, where he was interrogated for over seven hours. He wasn't read his rights, and he didn't have a lawyer present, or even his parents. Dan and Doris Truscott actually had no idea that their son had been taken into custody. With one child having disappeared, later turning up dead, Stephen's parents were understandably panicked when he didn't come home from school. 14-year-old Stephen was scared and anxious, but did his best to keep a stoic exterior. This frustrated the lead detective on the case, a rising star named Harold Graham, who was determined to get a confession. But Stephen stuck to his story. He said he rode with Lynn from the school, past Lawson's Bush, over the bridge and to the highway, where he saw her getting into a late model Chevy. When hours passed and Stephen still hadn't confessed, Graham decided to have a medical exam performed on Stephen. He hoped it would yield forensic evidence that might force Stephen into a confession. In an effort to be objective, Graham brought in the Truscott's family doctor, Dr. Joseph Addison, who performed the exam alongside the police's own medical examiner. By this time, Stephen's parents had learned their son's whereabouts, and Stephen's father, Dan, had arrived at the station. A military man himself, Stephen's father saw no reason to question whether the proceedings were being done according to proper protocol. And when Stephen was asked to submit to a medical exam, it didn't occur to Stephen's father not to acquiesce. Besides, it would have looked suspicious if Stephen didn't agree to the exam. Dan figured his son had nothing to hide, so why risk appearing difficult? The two doctors examined Stephen late into the evening on June 12th. They were extremely surprised by what they found. On either side of Stephen's penis were two very large sores, each about the size of a quarter. Stephen didn't have an explanation for how he got the sores, but said that they had been there for about four to five weeks. The doctors were doubtful. For one thing, the sores seemed painful enough that they didn't believe Stephen could have lived with them for very long without being driven to seek help. The doctors guessed that the sores were no more than a week old and had been present for at least 48 hours. They concluded that the sores were likely the product of Stephen forcibly violating Lynn. Meanwhile, in another corner of the police precinct, district pathologist Dr. John Penniston was just beginning Lynn Harper's autopsy. Dr. Penniston, how goes it? Well, it seems the little girl had a full stomach at the time of her death. I can clearly see about one pound of poorly masticated peas, potatoes, turkey, and corn. What does that mean? Well, for a healthy girl like Lynn, I'd say she couldn't have eaten more than two hours before the time of her death. I'd say she died between 7.15 and 7.45 p.m. That's precisely the time she was on an alleged bike ride with Stephen Truscott. Things were not looking good for Stephen, but he still refused to confess. Inspector Graham was growing increasingly frustrated. Seeing this, the Truscott family doctor asked if he could take a turn questioning the boy. If things weren't exactly to protocol before, allowing a civilian to interrogate Stephen was throwing procedure out the window. It's not clear what Inspector Graham was thinking when he told the doctor to go ahead. It was now the early hours of Saturday, June 13th, nearing the end of a very long day for Stephen Truscott. He had been removed from his school, 
question for many hours and had received an invasive and embarrassing medical examination, and now he was being questioned by his doctor. Stephen had been asked over and over if he had taken Lynn into Lawson's bush at any point during their bike ride, and over and over he had told them no, he hadn't. But this time, when the doctor asked that same question, Stephen said he didn't know. He may have gone into the bush. He wasn't sure. Maybe he did. Stephen's vague admission, gathered in the wee hours of the morning by the family doctor, was enough to convince Inspector Graham that he had his culprit. At about 2.30 a.m. on June 13th, 14-year-old Stephen Truscott was charged with the murder of Lynn Harper, a crime punishable by death. Coming up, Stephen Truscott goes to trial. And now, back to the story. 14-year-old Stephen Truscott had just been arrested for the murder of his classmate Lynn Harper, a 12-year-old girl living on the Air Force base in Clinton, Ontario. The trial was scheduled to begin about three months later, on September 16, 1959. Stephen's family didn't have the money to hire a lawyer, but they approached a well-known attorney named Frank Donnelly and asked if he would represent their son pro bono. Your son is Stephen Truscott? The Stephen Truscott I've been reading about in the papers for weeks? I'm afraid so. So what do you think? Will you represent our son? Are you kidding me? Of course I will. Really? Wow. Thank you. You don't know how much this means to us. No problem. You know, I was actually up for a promotion to be a judge, which I will have to postpone to take this case. But it's totally worth it. This is going to be the case of the century. The Truscotts were about to find out just how true this statement was. Stephen's trial began on Wednesday, September 16, 1959, just a little over three months after Lynn's murder. The Juvenile Delinquents Act would have dictated that Stephen, a minor, be tried anonymously. But the town's collective thirst for justice probably led to the judge's decision to try him publicly as an adult. Stephen was put in a wooden box facing the judge, as was customary in Canada at the time. When asked, he pleaded not guilty to the murder of Lynn Harper. The trial drew an enormous crowd. Everyone in the town wanted to see someone pay for what had happened to Lynn. But not everyone thought that that someone should be Stephen. Many were convinced that the kind, well-liked boy could not possibly have done what he was accused of. Even Lynn's parents were uncertain. Exhausted and emotionally destroyed, they too sat in the courthouse. I just want to see that monster put away forever. I know. I want whoever did this to our baby to be locked away too. But we don't know if it's Stephen yet. He hasn't had his trial. I know he did it. I know it as sure as I know my Lynn is gone. Meanwhile, for Stephen's parents, their nightmare was just beginning. Frank, do you think we could have some women on the jury? Women? Why? I don't know. I was just thinking that maybe some women with teenage sons might be more sympathetic to Stephen. They might be more willing to hear him out and give him a fair trial. No, no, women are too emotional. You just leave the jury selection stuff to me, sweetheart. I... Are you the lawyer or am I? Oh, that's right, it's a me. Don't you worry, Doris. Stephen has nothing to hide. The trial will show that. We just need people who can think rationally and clearly. The jury was 12 men selected from a pool of 90 locals. They were farmers, laborers, and people who worked local vocational jobs. The defense's case hinged on proving the timeline Stephen had presented to the police was plausible. They needed to convince the jury that he was biking with Lynn when he said he was. This meant finding witnesses who could corroborate Stephen's story, saying that they saw him on the road that stretched from the bridge and the highway between 7.15 and 7.45 p.m. on June 9th. 
A quick geography refresher here. The road that Lynn and Stephen were on was called the County Road. If you started on the County Road from the school and headed north, you would pass Lawson's Bush on your right before going over the bridge of the swimming hole. And then finally you'd come to Highway 8, which ran perpendicular to the County Road. If Stephen had been seen with Lynn after passing Lawson's Bush, that would prove his innocence. Unfortunately for him, three people came forward and said that they had seen him in just those circumstances. One was an 11-year-old boy named Dougie Oates, whose favorite thing in the world was catching turtles in the river. Dougie was standing up by the bridge on the evening of June 9th, as Lynn and Stephen zoomed past, so he saw them at close range. He remembered saying hi to the pair as they went by. Further down the river, another boy said he saw Lynn and Stephen at that same time. His name was Gordon Logan, and he was a 12-year-old using the warm evening to do some fishing. Gordon says that he saw Stephen a second time about five minutes later, alone. This further corroborates Stephen's story from when he was interrogated, in which he said that he dropped off Lynn at the highway, then came back and stood on the bridge for five to ten minutes. Stephen was also seen at this same time by Dougie's 16-year-old brother, Alan Oates. For a lot of the children questioned in the case, exact times were fuzzy, as they didn't wear watches and had no way of telling the time. But Alan was sure that the time he saw Stephen was around 7.45, because his favorite program had just ended on TV. The defense also challenged the suggestion that the footprint found at the scene of the crime could be Stephen's. Even the officer who found the imprint was reluctant to say with any certainty that it could belong to any one specific shoe. In fact, it was too faint to even see what kind of sole the shoe had. With no forensic evidence to tie him to the crime scene and the three boys who saw him during the window of time when Lynn died, Stephen's lawyer was confident that they'd be getting a verdict of not guilty. But it wasn't quite so simple. There were also witnesses who had been on the road between 715 and 745 who had not seen Stephen, which the prosecution said indicated that Stephen must have been in Lawson's bush with Lynn during that time. The prosecution argued that if Stephen and Lynn were actually on the road like Stephen said they were, then by all accounts, they should have been seen by at least one of these people. One such person was Jocelyn Gaudette, a shy and pockmarked girl in Stephen and Lynn's class who, like Lynn, often found herself on the fringes of the in crowd. Jocelyn claims that the day before Lynn's disappearance on June 8th, Stephen had made a date to go with her into Lawson's bush the following evening to look for lost calves. Well, Stephen says he never made this arrangement, but Jocelyn says that on the evening of June 9th, around 5.50 p.m., Stephen came to her house to get her for their date. Jocelyn was still eating dinner with her family and couldn't go. It's reported that local kids did many things in Lawson's Bush. They built forts, hiked around, and went looking for calves. But police thought that what Stephen was planning to do there with Jocelyn was a bit more romantic in nature. Jocelyn was key for the prosecution. They said that her story established a motive for Stephen. He wanted to go into the bush with someone, and when Jocelyn bailed, he took the next available girl he could find, Lynn. By their account, this was a crime of passion. Teenage hormones that could not be suppressed. The crime of a sexual deviant who lost control. And that wasn't the end of Jocelyn's story. She claimed that after she finished dinner on June 9th, she had gone out looking for Stephen. She rode up and down the county road looking for him, but couldn't find him anywhere. But as with many of the other children, Jocelyn's testimony was problematic. The time that she was supposed to have been out on the road looking for Stephen shifted back and forth between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Well, maybe she was just bad at keeping details straight, or maybe she'd been doing something she didn't want to own up to. We do know that at one point during the trial, Jocelyn went to Farmer Lawson, the owner of Lawson's Bush, and asked him to change his story 
to match hers. So it's definitely fishy that she didn't see Stephen on the road during the window of 7.15 to 7.45 on June 9th, but so is all of her testimony. But she wasn't the only one with a less than airtight story. Next, the prosecution called Butch George to the stand, the friend of Stevens who'd visited him on June 9th while he babysat his siblings after Lynn was last seen. The prosecution said that Butch was a second person who should have come into contact with Stephen and Lynn if they were really out on the road as Stephen said they were. Butch claimed that he had been out on the county road looking for Stephen on the night of June 9th, but he hadn't been able to find him anywhere. This testimony had the potential to be devastating to Stephen's case. Despite the fact that Butch's account of the time that he had been on the road kept shifting. But what he had to say next was even worse for Stephen. He admitted to having told several friends that Stephen had been in Lawson's Bush with Lynn. At one point, Butch claimed that Stephen himself had told him that he was in the bush with Lynn looking for a calf on the day of their bike ride. But Butch's account varied widely over the course of the investigation and trial. And not just the trial, he was generally known around town to be a bit of a fibber. Whatever the case, his testimony would have dire consequences for his friend Stephen. Butch's story may have changed, but the prosecution had an explanation for the changes. They said that Butch had lied to protect his friend, but once he realized how serious the situation was, had decided to come clean. While neither Butch George nor Jocelyn Gaudet were particularly reliable witnesses, their combined testimonies painted a damning story, one that would be bolstered even further when, several days into the trial, Lynn's mother, Shirley, took the stand. Mrs. Harper, had your daughter ever been known to travel long distances on her own? No, sir. Had she ever, to your knowledge, hitchhiked? Not to my knowledge. But I guess I often didn't know where she was. But uh, my answer is no. Not to my knowledge. Ugh. Please don't talk out of turn, Mrs. Truscott. But the Harpers thought Lynn could have gone all the way to her grandmother's on the night she went missing. That's quite enough, Mrs. Truscott. Mrs. Truscott did have a point. Lynn's parents had thought she might have gone to her grandmother's on the night of June 9th. And her friends had given accounts of hitchhiking with Lynn in the past, usually to see the ponies on Highway 8 that she had mentioned to Stephen the night she went missing. But there's no evidence that her friends were ever asked about Lynn's hitchhiking tendencies in court. Odd, since they likely would have had a much better idea of this than Lynn's parents. But in the courtroom, the prosecution had successfully challenged the image of Lynn Harper as a frequent hitchhiker. With this on the floor, the team shifted its attack to the crucial portion of Stephen's testimony. The moment on June 9th when he claimed to have seen Lynn getting into a strange car. The lawyers seized on Stephen's description of the car, questioning whether a boy could see not only the make and model but also the license plate from a distance of some 1,300 feet. Their attack ignored the fact that Stephen had actually never claimed to know the maker model of the car with any certainty. He just said what he thought he saw. Likewise, he said he saw something yellow on the back of the car, but he never claimed to read the license plate. And then there were the mysterious sores on Stephen's genitals. Next to the stand, we have Dr. John Penniston. Dr. Penniston, you examined the body for signs of rape, correct? Correct. And did you find signs of rape on the victim? Her body was beginning to have significant decay by the time she was found, but it is my opinion that there are wounds in her genital region that are consistent with having been raped. And would these be consistent with the wounds found on Stephen Truscott's penis? They could be, yes. The all-male jury was repulsed by the gruesome details of Lynn's rape and the sores on Stephen's genitals. After hearing testimony for two weeks, they were ready to give their verdict. On September 30th, the Harpers, the Truscotts, 
and the entire town of Clinton waited on pins and needles as the jury filed back into the courtroom. Will the defendant and the defense counsel please stand? Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, my lord. We find the accused guilty on all charges. <sighs> my son, my baby boy. <laughs> you said all the evidence was circumstantial. You said they'd never find him guilty. I, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm as surprised as you are. He's just a child. A child. <laughs> On September 30, 1959, Stephen Truscott was sentenced to death by hanging for the murder of his 12-year-old classmate, Lynn Harper. Just 14 years old himself, he was the youngest person in Canada ever to face the death penalty. Shirley and Leslie Harper, will you give a statement? We don't want to talk to the media. We're just glad that it's over now. It's finally over, and that monster is going to pay. <laughs> but things were far from over. After the trial, Stephen's family would continue to appeal the court's decision and fight for their son's freedom. Decades later, the testimony of several of the prosecution's star witnesses would come under fire, while shocking new details emerged to paint the case in a new light including a lost psychiatric file that might hold the identity of a killer who walked free. But as each new detail emerged and the possibility that Stephen Truscott was innocent became more plausible, a disturbing new possibility came into focus. For if Lynn Harper's killer was truly still at large, it meant that they had destroyed not one, but two young lives. <sighs> I tell you, sweetheart, I am glad to be done with that case. Me too. I've barely seen you. You've been working such long hours. I guess that's what I get for being the wife of Inspector Graham. I'm sorry. I really am. But you have to put in the hours if you want to win. You did win, right? Of course I won. A jury tried Truscott and found him guilty. Yes, of course, dear. I didn't mean to question your work. It's just, they're going to hang a 14-year-old boy. I do hope they're sure. I, well, he, I don't like that a 14-year-old boy is being hanged any more than you do. But Stephen needs to pay for what he did. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that he did it. Pretty sure? Well, how sure can anyone be with these things? He did it. We proved it. Besides, who else could have done it anyway? This is our second episode on Lynn Harper in Ontario. Last week, we covered the horrific murder of 12-year-old Lynn Harper and the arrest and trial of the boy charged with her murder, her 14-year-old classmate, Stephen Truscott. This week, we'll follow Stephen's controversial appeals process and consider other possible suspects. <laughs> On the evening of June 9, 1959, 12-year-old Lynn Harper went for a bike ride with her classmate and crush, a 14-year-old boy named Stephen Truscott. The two attended school together on the Air Force Base in their small town of Clinton, Ontario. When Lynn didn't return home that night, her family sounded the alarm. Two days later, a search party found Lynn's corpse in a patch of woods near the base, with her clothes folded neatly nearby. It didn't take long for suspicion to fall on the last person to see her alive. Just two days after Lynn's body was found, 14-year-old Stephen Trescott was charged with murder. He was tried and convicted before the end of the summer. And on September 30th, 1959, Stephen was sentenced to death by hanging. On October 1st, 1959, Stephen's sentencing was already being drowned out by other headlines. The case was already fading from people's minds. They trusted that justice had been served and had begun to move on with their lives. 
The same could not be said for the families of Stephen Truscott and Lynn Harper, who were still trapped in a living nightmare. Stephen's family tried desperately to clear their son's name as his execution date loomed just weeks away. While they prayed that Stephen would be spared the death penalty due to his young age, they knew that his odds weren't good. Between 1920 and 1960, Canadian officials had executed plenty of people under the age of 20. But on November 20th, 1959, Stephen saw his first glimmer of hope since being charged with Lynn's murder. Justice Minister Davy Fulton, the head of the Canadian Department of Justice, announced his decision to postpone Stephen's execution in order to give his lawyers a chance to appeal. The new execution date was set for February 16, 1960. The decision filled Stephen's family with fresh hope, but there was no time to celebrate. They had to put everything into the appeal. The Truscotts turned to John O. Driscoll, a cutthroat attorney who was well-known in Ontario. They hoped that he would succeed where Stephen's previous attorney, Frank Donnelly, had come up short. O. Driscoll was given only a few short weeks to prepare for the hearing. On January 21, 1960, the five judges on the Ontario Court of Appeal took their seats to hear Stephen's case. Per Canadian law, no new evidence could be considered during the appeal process. Only points of law could be discussed. This meant that O'Driscoll would have to convince the judges of Stephen's innocence by exposing flaws in the way Stephen's trial had been handled. He started the hearing by reviewing the unreliable testimonies that had been given by local Clinton children during the trial, particularly the testimonies of Jocelyn Gaudette and Butch George. After pointing out the many inconsistencies in their stories, O'Driscoll suggested that the young witnesses might have been flexible with their testimonies because they did not understand the meaning of witnessing under oath. Next, O'Driscoll turned his focus to Justice Ferguson, the judge who had presided over Stephen's trial. He argued that Ferguson had been openly critical of Stephen for not testifying on his own behalf, which could have swayed the jury to see the boy in a negative light. And finally, he pointed to an incident that had occurred in the latter half of Stephen's trial, when prosecuting lawyer Glenn Hayes referenced something he shouldn't have. Prosecution, please. Good men of the jury. You will not be hearing any confessions today. But still, on the night of June 21st, a statement was taken from Stephen Truscott, which he signed... Mr. Hayes, you know better than this. You cannot use that statement in court. My mistake, Your Honor. I apologize and withdraw my comment. Before being cut off by Justice Ferguson while addressing the jury, Hayes made a reference to a signed statement Stephen had made to the police. The way Hayes had spoken about it suggested that it had been some sort of confession. In reality, Stephen's statement had been an assertion of innocence, but the jury would never know this. Justice Ferguson had declared it inadmissible because Stephen had given it before he was told that he was being charged with a crime. While the justice's intent was to maintain the impartiality of the jury, O'Driscoll argued that cutting off Hayes in that moment had the opposite effect. It took Stephen's statement of innocence and made it look like a confession. After considering O'Driscoll's argument, the justices of the appeal court agreed that this misunderstanding could have been grounds for throwing out Stephen's original trial. They also agreed that certain arguments and pieces of evidence that had been employed by the prosecution were misleading. For example, a pair of Stephen's underwear containing trace amounts of blood and sperm had been presented to the court as the underwear Stephen had been wearing on the night Lynn was killed. However, this undergarment had actually been taken from him four days later, after he had already been placed in jail. As O'Driscoll pointed out, it was extremely unlikely that Stephen was still wearing that same pair of underwear four days later, particularly since his mother, Doris Truscott, testified that she had done laundry the day after Lynn's disappearance. But despite these discrepancies in the original trial, the most useful elements for proving Stephen's innocence were unfortunately, still unknown to his lawyer. In 1959, the police and prosecution were under no legal obligation to share their evidence and findings with the defense. 
So O'Driscoll had no idea that Lynn's parents had given three separate statements, saying that they thought she'd hitched a ride to her grandmother's on the night of June 9th, even though they had said during the trial that Lynn never hitchhiked. O'Driscoll also had no idea that the original interviews gathered from the defense's star witnesses, Jocelyn Gaudette and Butch George, did not indicate Stephen's guilt. It was only after they had spent considerable time with the police that their stories became useful for the prosecution. These facts went unexamined at Stephen's appeal. And though the justices agreed with O'Driscoll on many points, their re-examination of the evidence presented at Stephen's original trial only led them to the same conclusion. Stephen's guilty verdict would be upheld. On January 20th, 1960, just two days after Stephen's birthday, his appeal was dismissed. Newly 15, he was headed to the gallows. While there was general agreement amongst Canadian authorities that Stephen had committed the crime he was accused of, Justice Minister Davy Fulton, the Department of Justice head who had already postponed Stephen Truscott's execution once, was still uneasy. Let the record show that on this date, the 21st of January, 1960, the federal cabinet's meeting at the House of Commons has two items on the agenda. The scheduled hangings of one Marvin McKee and two Stephen Truscott. Hold on. Stephen is 14, correct? He's a boy. He's 15 now, Your Honor. He should still pay for his crime. Of course, but think of how it will look for Canada. Are we going to be the country that hangs a child? You do raise a good point. Stephen's second lucky break came on January 21st, 1960. At 12.23 p.m. on January 22nd, a telegram arrived at the Goderich jail. Get up, Truscott. Got a message for you. Governor General in Council has commuted the death sentence of Stephen Murray Truscott to life imprisonment in the Kingston Penitentiary. Looks like that hotshot lawyer of yours was worth it after all, Truscott. No death penalty, just a life behind bars. Canadian authorities had settled on a life in prison for Stephen, but they struggled to find a place for him to serve that sentence. They worried about sending a child to a federal penitentiary full of adult criminals and scoured the Canadian legal code for an alternative option. Well, they found one in the Penitentiary Act of 1868. The law stipulated that a convict under 16 could be transferred to a reformatory prison if he or she appeared capable of reformation. He just had to enter the penitentiary system first. Stephen spent one night in a Canadian penitentiary so that he could be officially deemed eligible for reformation and transfer. He was then sent to the Ontario Training School for Boys, a correctional facility in Guelph that looked more like a schoolhouse than a prison. Stephen made the six-hour trip in ankle chains and handcuffs. His guards wouldn't remove the handcuffs even when they stopped for a meal at a diner. But much to the school official's surprise, when Stephen arrived at the Ontario Training School for Boys in February 1960, he was polite, quiet, and shy. In fact, Stephen quickly became a favorite amongst the guards and teachers and found himself forming friendships with many of the inmates. The cook, Alice Hebden, took such a liking to Stephen that within a month he had gained 12 pounds. According to Alice, everyone at the school had a hard time matching the heinous crime Stephen had committed with the polite, sweet boy in front of them. Many at the school thought Stephen was innocent. One of the guards even allowed Stephen to play with his young daughters when they came to events at the school. But while Stephen was charming his friends and teachers, not everyone was won over instantly. From the moment Stephen arrived at the school, he began undergoing rigorous psychological testing. He didn't know it then, but this was a process he'd participate in for the next decade. He was seen by several psychiatrists, including H.J. Breen, J.P. Cathcart, and Dr. James Hartford. They had Stephen fill out extensive personality tests, which aimed to answer questions like, did Stephen read sex literature? And how did he feel when he heard Lynn was dead? 
Well, Stephen's answers to these questions did not imply that he was psychologically disturbed, but the psychiatrist noted that Stephen was defensive and guarded. They found it suspicious how well he was answering the questions and wondered if the reason for it was a cold, calculating interior underneath his rather hapless exterior. Based on their tests and the fact that Stephen still refused to confess, he was diagnosed with a cocktail of mental health disorders, including borderline personality disorder, pathological lying, mild paranoia, and moderate psychopathic tendencies. There could hardly be two more diametrically opposed descriptions of a teenage boy. To his psychiatrists, Stephen was a repressed, devious troublemaker and master manipulator who had murdered his classmate. But ask the school's staff, and you'd hear that he was a sweet, quiet schoolboy convicted of a crime that he didn't commit. It's difficult to say which version represented the real Stephen. Soon, both parties found themselves wondering if there was something they just weren't seeing. Coming up, we'll find out who the real Stephen was and what was in store for him. And now, back to our story. In 1960, 15-year-old Stephen Truscott was serving the first year of his life sentence at the Ontario Training School for Boys after being convicted of the murder of his 12-year-old classmate, Lynn Harper. Stephen's family continued to fight for their son and hadn't given up hope of winning his freedom and clearing his name. Since they hadn't had any luck with the Ontario Court of Appeal, they moved up the ladder to their next available option. On February 22, 1960, Stephen's lawyer, John O'Driscoll, filed an appeal with Canada's Supreme Court. But on February 24, only two days later, the request was denied. Frustratingly, no reason was given. For Stephen, this meant the end of the road. His lawyers had tried every legal avenue to set him free, and they had failed. All his team had left was their faith that someone would eventually realize the system had made a mistake. For Stephen's parents, Dan and Doris Truscott, that faith was fading fast. They had done their best to remain strong for their other three children, but were now finding it much harder to maintain hope. The Truscotts had moved out of Clinton shortly after Stephen's trial in an attempt to regain some semblance of normalcy and privacy. They had relocated to Richmond, a small town close to Ottawa. But it was tough to feel normal while driving over 300 miles every other weekend to see Stephen in Guelph. And the frequent trips were a large financial burden for the Truscotts, who had three other children to raise and a mortgage to pay. Both Dan and Doris took on extra jobs, which eased the financial strain but stretched them even thinner. They finally purchased a trailer, which they kept in the yard of school cook Alice Hebden to cut their living costs ever so slightly. Alice remembers staying up with Dan Truscott until 5.45 a.m. because he was so sick with grief for his son. We failed him. We failed our son. He's locked away in there, missing his whole life. Hey now, Mr. Truscott, don't talk like that. Stephen won't be locked up forever. How can you be so sure? Everyone else seems to think our boy is a soulless monster. People who don't know him, maybe. Anyone who does can see plain as day that he's innocent. And the rest of the world will catch up soon enough. (sighs) That means the world, Alice. Regardless of what the cook thought... Stephen still had a sentence to serve, and as of January 18, 1963, he could no longer serve it at the Ontario School for Boys. He had just turned 18, and things were about to get a lot worse for him. The day after Stephen's birthday, the entire school wept as he was driven away. Stephen was transferred to the Collins Bay Penitentiary in Kingston, where he was stripped of his name and given a number. From then on, he would be inmate number 6730. Stephen began to lose all hope of freedom. Alone in his cell in Collins Bay, he was forced to admit 
that he had been fantasizing about a pipe dream. But Stephen's growing sense of despair couldn't stop him from thinking constantly about leaving the prison. In 1964, at the age of 19, he took his first opportunity to apply for parole. What he wrote in his application was jaw-dropping. Did you read Truscott's application? Truscott? Number 6730. Listen, I know five years is not very long for a sentence like mine, but I was very young and all I ask is just one chance to prove that I'm worthy of being allowed to mix with society. I've done my best to keep a clean record while I'm serving my sentence. I have reached the stage where being locked up will be of no more good to me. I've paid five years of my life, but this has taught me that crime does not pay. So all I ask is please grant me one chance to make a success of my life and prove that one dreadful mistake does not mean that I will ever make another one. Crime doesn't pay? One dreadful mistake? Is this a confession? The meaning of Stephen's parole request would be debated within the prison, but was largely taken as a confession. This interpretation of his letter made it much less likely he would be released on parole. But even if that weren't the case, there was an even larger barrier to Stephen's parole being approved. His release required the sign-off from his prison psychiatrist, Dr. George Scott, and that was not something he was going to get. Well, Dr. Scott had been performing psychological testing on Stephen since his arrival in Kingston. His methods were a bit more experimental than those used at the Ontario Training School for Boys. Dr. Scott was a large proponent of narcotherapy, the use of drugs for therapeutic purposes. Stephen was given sodium pentothal, otherwise known as truth serum, as well as LSD. Have you made any progress with Stephen Truscott? You mean a confession? No, not at all. And you know, it's strange. He doesn't seem to remember much about his life from before the murder. All I can get out of him is we used to play ball, we went swimming when it was hot, that sort of thing. You think he's being cagey with you? No, Warden. I think he's repressed his memories. He doesn't remember killing Lynn. It's buried somewhere deep down in the folds of his brain. This sort of thing can happen when a person is overcome by a a psychotic episode, one they don't like to think back on later. So now you have to see if you can get him to crack? Not if I can get him to crack. When? On January 18th, 1965, Stephen spent his 20th birthday in jail. Stephen didn't know it, but outside his cell, the world was beginning to change. Well, for one thing, the 60s were now in full swing, and they had brought with them a range of liberal new attitudes and ideas. For the first time, people were beginning to question the institutions and structures around them that had long been seen as infallible. It was a sign of the times that the new hit show on TV was called The Fugitive, and its hero was a man who had been wrongfully convicted by the police. In the midst of this wave of questioning authority came a book that would forever change Stephen's life. Released in 1966, it was entitled The Trial of Stephen Truscott. The book was the passion project of Isabelle Le Bourdais, a social activist who fervently believed that Stephen was wrongfully imprisoned. In writing her book, Isabelle had obtained the court transcripts from Stephen's 1959 trial in their entirety, something no casual observer had ever done before. By combing through the reports of Dr. John Penniston, the pathologist who performed the autopsy on Lynn, she found some key discrepancies in his findings. In Dr. Penniston's first report to the police, he indicated that the time of death lay within a 24 to 48 hour window. It was only after Stephen was charged on June 13, 1959, that Penniston became much more specific, narrowing it down to a mere 30 minutes. Isabel argued that this was a clear example of molding evidence to fit a theory. She also managed to get a hold of the original interviews given by the children who testified in Stephen's case, including the original reports given by Jocelyn Gaudet and Butch George, 
which did not implicate Stephen as Lynn's killer. The information presented in Isabel's book was compelling. It painted a picture of police work that was hastily and shoddily performed and a trial that had been a travesty of justice. As she presented the evidence, it seemed as if the police had picked their suspect and then manipulated the evidence to support their theory. Well, there are a couple of reasons police may have wanted to pin the crime on Stephen Truscott, even if the evidence had been flimsy. Well, for one, Inspector Graham, the lead investigator on the case, was the youngest lead investigator in his branch, and he was extremely ambitious and eager to keep moving upward. And a great way to do that would be to quickly solve the case of a high-profile murder like Lynn's. If Isabel Laborde was correct, Stephen had been a convenient scapegoat. At just 14 years old, he wasn't well-versed in the law, which made him a very manageable suspect. Well, to make matters more complex, the crime's proximity to the military base made it more than likely the culprit was a member of the armed forces. Charging a member of the military with murder would only cause tension around the base, which Inspector Graham was eager to avoid. While many people in Clinton were thoroughly convinced of Stephen's guilt, many more across the country were moved by the facts presented in Laborde's book. They were horrified by the thought of how close Canada had come to hanging an innocent kid. As public outcry increased in the wake of the book's release, the federal cabinet felt pressured to take action. On April 26, 1966, they asked the Supreme Court to take a second review of the case. This time, the court would be allowed to hear new evidence. In essence, Stephen would get a new trial. While this was great news for Stephen and his family, it was worrisome for others, particularly those who felt that their work on the original trial might be called into question. Three weeks after the trial was announced, Inspector Graham received a letter from Dr. John Penniston, the pathologist who had performed Lynn's autopsy and determined her time of death. Dear Inspector Graham, I am writing to you in light of the renewed interest in Stephen Truscott's trial. Truth be told, I have been a bit restless lately, thinking about my role in the case. While I certainly do think that Lynn Harper could have died between 7.15 and 7.45 p.m., I also think that she could have died outside of that window, a good bit outside of that window if I'm being completely honest. I also think that some of the injuries we thought were from rape really could have just been decay from lying in the forest during a heat wave. I'd like to publish my updated thoughts in a medical journal to set the record straight. Please, let me know what you think. Sincerely, John. What the devil is wrong with this idiot? Why is he second-guessing the good work we did in 1959? Where's his phone number? <sighs> Dr. Penniston did not publish his findings in a medical journal, presumably at Inspector Graham's urging, nor would he testify at Stephen's new trial. The trial began on October 5, 1966. This time around, Stephen's lawyers were E.B. Jolliffe, R.J. Carter, and Arthur Martin, a local legend whose associated catchphrase was, his clients never hang. Though Penniston himself would not testify, Two medical experts were brought in to go over his work. They didn't need to read Penniston's letter to know that many of the conclusions he drew from his findings in 1959 were not possible. The contents of Lynn's stomach were the sole tool Penniston had used in determining Lynn's time of death. And his method for the analysis had always been presented as cutting-edge science. In reality, Penniston put the contents in a jar, held it up to the light, and through the smoke of his pipe, eyeballed it for his best guess on what he could see. This is probably why he had several conflicting guesses as to what was in Lynn's stomach. It's tough to correctly identify partially digested food. Even with modern technology, experts agree it's nearly impossible to determine an exact time of death, and certainly impossible to pinpoint it to within a half an hour based on stomach contents alone. 
So it's safe to conclude that the window for Lynn's time of death was not nearly as narrow as Peniston's testimony had led the court to believe in 1959. And without that narrow window, it becomes impossible to pin Lynn's death to Stephen with any degree of certainty. Another difference from the 1959 trial was that this time around, Stephen's defense team conducted their own tests to determine whether Stephen could have seen a car from the bridge, some 1,300 feet away. They presented conclusive evidence that, from the bridge, Stephen could have seen the make, model, and color of the license plate of a car on the highway. This proved that the original inspectors ignored a potential lead, all because they thought Stephen had to have been lying about the car. Martin also focused on the scrapings taken from under Lynn's fingernails. Given that there was blood under her nails, Lynn's killer would probably have scratches on his face, neck, and hands. No such scratches were present on Stephen when he returned to the schoolyard after his bike ride with Lynn on June 9th. As in the case of the appeal trial, several potentially significant facts were not made available to Stevens' attorneys. If the police had been legally obligated to share all of their reports with the defense, Martin would have known that the original police bulletin instructed officers to be on the lookout for anyone with scratches on their face, neck, and hands. This fact appears even more suspicious when the police seem to have dropped interest in finding a culprit with scratches altogether once Stephen was arrested. Once again, Stephen's attorneys were operating without all of the information. But the defense did have one more thing up their sleeve in 1966 that they had never employed before. This time around, Stephen would testify on his own behalf. When Stephen took the stand, jury and spectators alike were eager to hear what he had to say. He had maintained his innocence for so long, and now he would finally be sharing his own account of what happened on the night of June 9th. But, inexplicably, Stephen did not prep for his big moment and was fuzzy and confused on the stand. He even contradicted his own account of what happened in 1959. He was not particularly compelling, and his testimony did little to convince the judges that he was innocent. This was only compounded by what Stephen had written in his parole request two years earlier when he said that he'd learned that crime doesn't pay and referenced having made a dreadful mistake. Stevens defense counsel tried to explain what he wrote in the application, saying that through his experience with other inmates, he had learned that crime doesn't pay and isn't a viable lifestyle. They said the bit about the dreadful mistake was included because Stephen believed he would get out of prison faster if he just pretended to own up to something. Their argument was a tough sell, Stephen's letter really had sounded like a confession. The Supreme Court's deliberation took weeks, which turned into months. The Truscotts and the public waited eagerly for a verdict. Finally, on May 6, 1967, at 10.30 a.m., Justice John Cartwright read the court's decision. Eight to one, the justices voted to uphold the original decision made by the jury in Stephen's 1959 trial. Stephen would stay in prison. As Stephen heard the news, his eyes filled with tears. After everything, he was no closer to clearing his name or securing his release. Still only 22 years old, he seemed destined to remain in prison until the day he died. Coming up, Stephen Truscott gets one last shot at freedom. Now, back to the story. In 1966, Stephen Truscott received another great chance at freedom when the Canadian Supreme Court decided to review his 1959 conviction for the murder of his classmate and neighbor, 12-year-old Lynn Harper. By this point, Stephen was 21 years old and had been incarcerated for seven years. While the news that fresh evidence would be admitted into the trial filled Stephen's family with hope, it was soon dashed. On May 6, 1967, the Supreme Court justices upheld Stephen's original conviction. Though Stephen was devastated, 
Many people in the town of Clinton were pleased with the court's decision. The locals who convicted a teenage boy and who had come under fire from Laborde's book on Stephen's 1959 trial. For Lynn's family, the trial was an extremely painful reopening of an old wound. They were already convinced that Stephen Truscott had killed their daughter. They didn't need a second trial to reassure their conviction. For some, the trial restored their faith in the justice system. But for others, it did the exact opposite. With implications that went far beyond the murder of Lynn Harper and her killer, it represented a complete and utter shattering of their trust. Protests broke out, calling for Stephen's immediate release from prison. People took to the streets, holding signs and chanting. They felt that justice had been grossly mishandled. But having public opinion on his side was not going to get Stephen out of jail. On May 7, 1967, he was transferred to the farm annex at Collins Bay, a privilege reserved for criminals who weren't considered to be volatile or dangerous. All Stephen could do now was maintain good behavior and wait for a chance at parole. On December 24, 1968, that good behavior paid off. Dr. Scott, the psychiatrist at Collins Bay who had long maintained Stephen was suppressing his guilty memories, gave the warden a new report on Stephen's health. I've wanted to be very sure about this because I know the consequences can be dire if I'm wrong. But, well, take a look. What is it? It's a clean bill of mental health for Stephen Truscott. I know that if Stephen commits another murder, it's on my hands. But I feel confident that we won't be having any issues with him. With Dr. Scott's approval on hand, Stephen applied for parole again. This time he was approved on October 21st, 1969, a little over 10 years after he was sentenced to death by hanging, Stephen was released from prison. After briefly living with his parole officer to avoid public attention, Stephen moved to Vancouver, where he married Marlene Bowers, a woman who had closely followed his trials. Under an assumed name, they lived a relatively private life and had three children. But when new advancements in DNA technology revealed errors made in other high-profile Canadian cases, Stephen decided that it was time to step back into the limelight. He was the subject of a documentary made in 2000 by the Fifth Estate, which, like Isabel Laborde's book, outlined the case for his innocence. The producers were able to obtain all of the files associated with the case. So they were, for the first time ever, able to see what Stephen's lawyers never had access to. Every single interview, report, and file logged by the police. This included the first interviews given by the children, the original police bulletin looking for a suspect with scratches to the arms and face, confirmation that Lynn had been known to hitchhike, and a much broader window for the time of death. There was just one thing missing. Producers had hoped to find DNA evidence from the case that would definitively say, once and for all, whether or not Stephen Trescott raped and murdered Lynn Harper. Unfortunately, all of the original DNA evidence collected from Lynn's body appeared to have long been disposed of. Despite this, the documentary reignited a media frenzy, and on November 28, 2001, a petition was filed to reopen Stephen's case. And while all of the DNA evidence had disappeared from the police storage facilities, there was still one place for investigators to look. On April 6, 2006, Lynn Harper's body was exhumed. Disappointingly, the nearly 47 years that had passed since Lynn's death had rendered any remaining DNA evidence unusable. Though no new evidence was collected from Lynn's body, Stephen Trescott's case returned to the Court of Appeal on June 19, 2006. This time, unlike his original trial and subsequent appeals, all of the police's records were available, and all of the facts were on the table. Most notably, the information pertaining to the time of Lynn's death. Stephen's original verdict had hinged on the time of Lynn's death being between 7.15 and 7.45 p.m. And while she certainly could have died within that time frame, 
The full police records show that Dr. Penniston's findings actually indicated a much larger window for the time of death, between 12 and 48 hours. With no forensic evidence to tie Stephen to the murder, the time of death was not enough to implicate him in the crime, and so the circumstantial evidence that led to his conviction in 1959 was found to be insufficient for a guilty verdict this time around. On August 28, 2007, at the age of 62, Stephen Truscott was acquitted for the murder of Lynn Harper. It's important to note that Stephen was not declared factually innocent. This means he was acquitted because there was not enough evidence to tie him to the crime, not because it can be proven without a doubt that he is innocent. Stephen Truscott remains a suspect in Lynn's murder to this day, but he did receive a personal apology from Attorney General Michael Bryant for the miscarriage of justice. We cannot definitively say that Stephen was innocent. Unfortunately, all we really know is that someone came in contact with Lynn at some point in the 48 hours after she disappeared on that hot summer day 60 years ago. Someone who wished her harm. It may have been Stephen, but if it wasn't, then one person in the small town of Clinton, Ontario, has been harboring a very dark secret for a long time. It's mystifying that the police never looked into other suspects because there are several other suspicious characters who might have been responsible for Lynn Harper's murder. One obvious place to start would have been a man named Alexander Kalachuk. Kalachuk was a 35-year-old airman living 12 miles from the Clinton base. Police may have focused in on him had his psychiatric file not gone mysteriously missing for a good 40 years. Kalachuk was a known pedophile, with a long record of indecent exposures, sexual indiscretions, and substance abuse. One such incident occurred on May 21, 1959, just one month before Lynn Harper was murdered. A 10-year-old girl named Nancy Davidson was walking home with two friends from school. They reached the homes of the two other girls first, leaving Nancy to complete the short walk to her own house alone. Nancy was almost there when she saw a car approaching. The man driving it was Alexander Kalachuk, and he tried to lure Nancy into the car with him. He said the two of them would go pick out a present for her. When that didn't work, Kalachuk tried to lure the little girl in with a set of children's underpants. Fortunately, Nancy's father saw the interaction and came running, and the little girl escaped. Kalachuk sped off, but Nancy's father called the police, who soon tracked him down. One week later, Kalachuk appeared in court for the incident. He told the judge that he had purchased underpants to use as prizes amongst the fishermen at Lake Erie, where he was headed the day he saw Nancy. When this didn't sway the judge, Kalachuk changed his story and said he was carrying the garments because he was throwing a party for the local children, and the underwear was meant to be prizes for them. Lacking conclusive evidence of a crime having taken place, the judge sent Kalachuk away with only a stern talking to. Thirteen days later, on the night of June 9th, Lynn Harper disappeared. Kalachuk was never asked to account for his whereabouts that night, but there's good reason to think he was near Clinton as his home was 12 miles from the base. Plus, we know that he had a penchant for cruising the country roads. And while we don't know his actions on the day of Lynn's disappearance, we do know that he did something suspicious shortly after. In early 1959, Kalachuk had bought a new car a pale yellow Pontiac Stratachief, a model with large fins on the rear. Very similar, in fact, to the late model Chevy Stephen Trescott described to the police. But curiously, in early July, Kalachuk sold his new car. A few weeks after Lynn's murder, a senior medical officer noted that Kalachuk was suffering from overwhelming anxiety, depression, and guilt. On July 22, 1959, he checked into a psychiatric hospital for those same symptoms. The psychiatrist assumed his condition was due to the incident with Nancy. 
but noted that it was quite a large reaction for something that legally hadn't even registered as a crime. Well, another possible explanation is that Kalachuk was experiencing a reaction to having murdered Lynn Harper. But if this was the case, we'll never know. Kalachuk was never considered a suspect in Lynn's murder. He walked free until his own death in 1975. Years later, when a possible connection was drawn between Kalachuk and Lynn's killing, Kalachuk's stepchildren said that they would not have been surprised if he was involved in the disappearance of the little girl. They remembered their mother's husband as creepy, odd, drunk, and angry, and they always did their best to avoid him. If only they had been asked about their stepfather at the time. Another person the police probably should have looked into is a man named Clayton Dennis, an appliance repairman who was contracted to work on the base. Like Kalachuk, Dennis had a history of sexual indiscretion, as he had served time at Collins Bay for rape in 1948. Dennis also knew the Harpers, because Lynn's dad, Leslie, was the one signing Dennis's checks. Dennis even came over to the Harpers' home once to fix their washing machine and presumably could have met Lynn. He left Seaforth in the fall of 1959, almost immediately after Lynn's death. He said he was just ready for a change of pace, but that's not how Gwen McKellar, the wife of Dennis's best friend, remembers things. Clayton? Clayton! I'm here to return the tire gauge that my husband borrowed. You looking for Clayton Dennis? He left. He left? Like he's not home, do you mean? No, he left the country. I think he said he was going to Florida. Florida? But all of his stuff is here. Yep. He just left in the middle of the night. Didn't say goodbye to anybody. Strangest thing I've ever seen. According to Gwen McKellar, Dennis regularly talked about sex in a way that she and her daughters found creepy. But that was nothing compared to the chilling response Dennis had to hearing of Lynn's murder. He said Lynn had it coming and that she was asking for it. Based on his proximity and access to the Harper family and history of rape, Dennis certainly should have been looked at with a closer lens. But like Kalachuk, Clayton Dennis was never formally investigated as a suspect. And he's not the final suspicious character police ignored. A third possible suspect for Lynn's murder is Matthew Marone, a 19-year-old airman. Marone worked as a lifeguard at the pool on the base, so he may have been familiar with Lynn, who was an avid swimmer. Shortly after Lynn's murder, he was transferred to Goose Bay, but was later kicked out of the Air Force for excessive drinking. He married and had two daughters, but the home he shared with his family wasn't a happy one. Marone had severe anger issues and routinely beat his wife. He also sexually abused both of his daughters. This alone should have positioned Marone as a potential suspect in the murder of Lynn Harper. But it's not even the most compelling piece of evidence against him. Once... A group of hunters caught Marone in the woods attempting to strangle his daughter because she refused to have sexual intercourse with him. Well, this crime bears a striking resemblance to Lynn's rape and murder, and it is baffling in hindsight that the police never thought to investigate a link between these two crimes. Mysteriously, Marone also told his wife that he knew Stephen Truscott was innocent. He didn't say how he knew, but one explanation could be that he had committed the crime himself. In Maron, Dennis, and Kalachuk, we have three men with alarming records, all living within close range of the last place Lynn was seen. If Stephen wasn't Lynn's killer, it seems likely that one of these three men was. Given all that we know about Kalachuk, I think he's the most likely person to have murdered Lynn. He had a known history of pedophilia, and the way he sold his car right after Lynn's body was found seems really suspicious to me. Interesting. See, I actually think that Matthew Marone is the most likely killer. He had a history of sexually abusing his own daughters, and his claim to know that Stephen was innocent reeks of his own secret guilt. Without DNA evidence to test, we're likely never to know the truth. 
But regardless of who killed Lynn Harper, it was a tragic event that forever changed both her small town of Clinton, Ontario, and the world's perceptions of Canada's legal system as a whole. <laughs>